I thank the Lord who has brought us to this session as we begin the series of messages on becoming an excellent minister. And I pray that the word will impact every life, even from this morning, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this hour. We thank you, Lord, because of what you are doing. And we pray, Lord, that in a very definite way, a mistakeable way, you touch every life, every minister, every professional, everyone present, everyone listening in Jesus' name. Amen. And we pray, Lord, that the impact of your word, the unction, the anointing that comes upon everyone will make everyone excel in ministry in Jesus' name. Be glorified and honored in every man, every woman, every profession, every minister, even from this hour in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. And the people of God said, Amen. God bless you. You can sit down. As you know, we've come together so we can have God's own mind, God's own purpose, God's own calling, and we can see what he means by excellence in life and ministry. And also to understand that every individual has the possibility, and we have the journey among us and the journey ahead of us, so that what it will take for you, for me, for everyone to have excellence in ministry, excellence in life, excellence in anything, everything we put our hands to, the Lord will grant you, grant me, grant everyone in Jesus' name. Now, as I begin the series today, I'm talking on a man of destiny. A woman of destiny, a daughter of destiny, a son of destiny. That you see yourself, wherever you are, whatever you are doing, whatever the Lord has called you to. That you see yourself as a son, a daughter of destiny. The topic this morning is an excelling minister, a man of destiny. Of course, if you are a woman... You see, an ex excelling minister, a daughter of destiny. We're going to use the life of Moses. And we're going to see how God began with him. And how God continued with him. And how God formed him. How God trained him. How God raised him up as a man of destiny. And then it's uh, what we call a transferable concept. A concept will pick from a man and knowing who God is, and he has a man, he has a woman, he has a son, he has a daughter. In every generation and in every community, what he did for one is able to do for others, and he's willing and he has promised that he'll do for another. That's why we call it a transferable concept. That the concept you have in Moses as God raised him up. As an excelling minister. And he became, and now we can see looking at the history of what God had done with him and through him, we know he was a man of destiny. Say, I am a man of destiny. I am a daughter of destiny. The Lord confirm it in your life in Jesus' name. We're looking at Exodus chapter 2, and I'm reading from verse 9. Exodus chapter 2, and we're looking at verse 9. It says, And Pharaoh's daughter said unto her, that he is unto Miriam, the senior sister of Moses. Take, oh, sorry, to the mother of Moses, take this child away and nurse it not the child for me, and I will give thee thy wages. And the woman, the mother, 
took the child and nursed it. And then we find in verse 10, in verse 10 it says, and the child grew. And a child grew. If we're going to do anything in life, we must grow. There are people that have the idea, as I was uh, five years ago, so I am today, and so I will be in five years' time. We must grow. In life, we grow. In our minds, we grow. In the things we do, we grow. In the vision we have, we grow. In the ability we have, we grow. In the, in the possibilities and productivity that we have, we grow. And in our skill, we also grow. And it says, and the child grew. Then it says, and she brought him unto Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. But it's going to go beyond that because a man of destiny is not just the son or the daughter of Mr. So-and-so. It's not just a member, a minister in this particular church or ministry or denomination. You're going to go beyond where you are at present in Jesus' name. And it says, and she called his name Moses and said, because I drew him out of the water think about that because i drew him out of the water her father pharaoh the king will say the emperor the leader the ruler of egypt had said every boy that is born every man child that is born you throw that child into the river and in a way pharaoh's daughter was saying what my father concerned consigned unto death i drew this child I drew Moses out of the water, out of the river, and I call him Moses. And then every time you mention Moses, Moses will remember I was taken out of the ocean and the river of death to come alive because I am a man of destiny. You look back, everything that has happened until this time in your life, where were you called out from? Where did you come from? So that you can be a man, a minister, and you can be a daughter, a son of destiny. Confirmation in your life in Jesus' name. And then we're told in Acts of the Apostles chapter 7, Acts chapter 7, looking at verse 23 and it, when he was full 40 years old when he was full 40 years old it came into his heart to visit his brethren the children of Israel you cannot forever be isolated from the field of ministry from the people you are supposed to touch and transform and take out of bondage into the land of Canaan into the appointed place the Lord has for them then it says in verse 25 in verse 25 it says for he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them but they understood not. Moses knew he had a ministry, an excellent ministry. Moses knew he had a ministry, a ministry that had been prophesied way beyond before even his fathers and grandfathers were born. A ministry that originated from the time God was talking to, Mo, uh, to Abraham. And he said, your people, your descendants, your progeny, they will go to a land that is not theirs. It will be a land of captivity, but then when the time arrives, I will bring them out. The time of Moses is the time that arrived. My time is the time that has now arrived. Your time is the time that has now arrived. God had thought about you. God had thought about Moses, and God saw Moses in the far distance. And then, when his time came, an excellent minister for an excellent ministry, and for such a time like this, arrived. And I pray that this will be the moment, and this will be the day when your time arrives. And when the time arrives, you rise up. You will achieve. You will do. 
God will make of you an excellent minister in Jesus name Amen. now in John chapter 15 reading from verse 16 John chapter 15 verse 16 ye have not chosen me but I have chosen you and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit now we're talking about a transferable concept here we've talked about moses and moses is long gone it's gone to his own reward but now christ speaking to his own disciples he said have you heard about anybody before that was chosen yes we have we know about Moses, we know about Aaron, we know about Joshua. Now, their time is gone. Your time is here. And now you told them now that you know that we're going to transfer the concept of Moses being chosen, Aaron being chosen, Joshua being chosen, and all the others in the old covenant being chosen. We're going to transfer that concept unto you. And now it says, Ye have not chosen me. Moses did not choose the ministry, but God chose him. How do we know that Moses did not choose the ministry? Because he said, Who am I? that as you go to Pharaoh and the same thing transferred to you today it says he have not chosen me but I the almighty I the I am that I am I the eternal one I the one that knows the end from the beginning it says I have chosen you and ordained you appointed you anointed you assigned you that he should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain your fruit will remain the birds of the air will not uh, pick the fruit of your ministry and then you don't find anything anymore what you see today you still see tomorrow what God is doing today will abide until the future in Jesus' name. That your fruit shall remain and that whatsoever ye shall ask the Father. Think about that. Whatsoever ye shall ask the Father. You know, sometimes when you read the promises of God, you need to ask yourself, why? Why? Now, because God chose Moses and he chose him to accomplish something and he was going to accomplish that thing in the land under the authority of pharaoh whatsoever moses will ask because he's at the point of duty it's on the field of duty whatsoever he asks the lord will do why because he was strong Mm -mm. because he was a great man not really because it was chosen to do something and that is what God himself wanted to do that's why anytime you saw Moses in the land of Egypt whatsoever he asked the father always did and then the Lord had said take them from this point and take them to that point between this point and that point needs will arise and whatsoever you you ask any point of the way any journey in the way God will do why because that was to take them ahead in the journey to the place they were going the same thing with us you're a man of destiny and a daughter of destiny and because it's taking you from here to there all along the way anything you ask because that will speed you up that will give you progress along the way to the end of the journey the lord will answer yeah. whatsoever he shall ask of the father in my name that will i give he will give each unto you as i said the message today is an excellent minister 
a man of destiny. Let's break the message down to three parts. Number one, the foundation of a man of destiny. A man of destiny cannot be hanging in the air. He has to have his feet on the solid ground. That means he has to be a person that has foundation. Number two, the findings of a man of destiny. The first one is the foundation, the ground on which you stand, the place in which you stand, the basis, the focus on where you stand. It's talking about the foundation. The number two, the findings along the way as you go on in an excellent life, in an excellent ministry, the findings you have. Findings about God, findings about yourself, findings about the field, and findings about the calling. The Lord has given you the findings of a man of destiny. Number three is the faithfulness of a man of destiny. The faithfulness of a man of destiny. Let's look at them one by one. Number one is the foundation of a man of destiny. We're looking at 2 Timothy chapter 2, and I'm reading from verse 19. 2 Timothy chapter 2, reading from verse 19, nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. God is a wise God. If he's going to plant, anything there must be a foundation if he's going to plant or raise up a man a woman a son of destiny a daughter of destiny there must be a foundation and that foundation stands sure it says nevertheless whatever we see whatever we don't see whatever we consider whatever we don't consider whatever wind may be blowing and whatever may be in our community here or there or anywhere and nevertheless, whatever happens, the foundation of God standeth sure. Having the seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. And let every man, everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Depart from iniquity. Now, you cannot do something here except you depart from there. That's the principle of life. You cannot do anything in front of the house except you depart from the back of the house. You cannot do anything on the roof except you depart from the dungeon. That principle you always find in your life. That if you're going to do something excellent and something excelling, you have to depart from there to come to hear. You cannot be a father until you depart from the life of a bachelor and the life of a spinster. And you think about that in your life. I want to do something up there. You have to depart from down there. I want to do something clear, something in a crystal, something great and something marvelous. You have to depart from there so that you can come over here. Can you look at your life and say, now I understand. I'm going to be an excellent minister. A man of destiny, a son of destiny, a daughter of destiny. I see I have to depart from there so that I can come up here. The Lord give you wisdom. And the Lord revealed to you the things where you are tied down. And you are, you are hooked there and you say, well, as long as I stay here, we have to depart. You have to depart from Egypt before you can get to Canaan. No matter what dreams you have, no matter what vision you have, and no matter what positive confession you make, as long as you live and abide in Egypt, you cannot plant any new seed in Canaan. There is the principle of departure. It says that anyone that names the name of Christ will depart from this and get to the heights. I see you on top. 
Now we're looking at three things here. Number one, we're looking at the formation of a man of destiny. The formation of a man of destiny. Number two, we're looking at the face of a man of destiny. Number three, at the focus of a man of destiny moving towards destiny on the move every time on the go every time because you are a man because you are a son because you are a woman because you are a daughter of destiny there's movement every time and today you are moving higher because you see every day you contribute to moving on moving on moving forward the focus of movement towards destiny. Look at number one there. Number one, the formation of a man of destiny. Remember, we're using Moses as our lead text so that we can see what God did in his life and God moving him from where he was to where he ought to be. That man, Moses, the formation. Look at Acts chapter chapter 7 and we're looking at verse 19 acts chapter 7 verse 19 the same dealt subtly with our kindred and evil entreated our fathers so that they cast out their young children to the end they might not live he's talking about the peculiar circumstances in which moses was born always think about that where was i born how was i born and what were the prevailing circumstances when i was born and yet in spite of that all in spite of all of that you'll still be a man of destiny and you'll still be a woman of destiny where was he born he was born in egypt why because there were people in egypt that he needed to take out of egypt to the promised land where were you born think about that in what circumstances was he born it was a time when they were drowning uh, all the boys in the land in the land of egypt and the israelite child born will be cast into the sea the devil had a purpose that the deliverer will never come the devil had a purpose that Moses to deliver the people will not survive beyond childhood. What happened in your childhood that you would have thought I would have gone, but here you are today. There's a purpose in your life. There's a reason why God has preserved you in the midst of all those problems, taking out of the sea let me fast uh, forward a little bit the man that threw them those children into the sea so that they will not leave fast forward and come to the red sea the people that he thought will not leave they lived and passed through the sea. The one that thought he was going to drown them, he himself was drowned at the Red Sea. The table will always turn. God had a purpose. He has a man, he has a woman, he has a son, he has a daughter. And God has the destiny for that son. I'm talking about you. And God has a destiny for that daughter. I'm talking about you. And anyone that will fight against God and will say that that son will not fulfill his destiny, don't even think about them. You will survive all the plots. You'll survive all the conspiracy. I will find you in the right place because the hand of God is upon you. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter the village you were born. It doesn't matter the primary school you went to. It doesn't matter what the old man said about you. It doesn't matter what the people of the land in your area said about you. What matters is you are a man of destiny what matters is you are the daughter of destiny 
praise the Lord. Amen. I said, praise the Lord. Amen. The Lord who has brought you thus far will take you as far as he has ordained for your life. Amen. We're looking at verse 20 there in verse 20. It says, in which time, at that terrible time, at that difficult time, Moses was born and was exceeding fear and nourished up in his father's house three months. Nourished up in his father's house three months. Now, why should the scripture mention that? How significant is that? Three months is one quarter of a year. And three months is uh, not up to one percent of 40 years, of 80 years, of, um, of uh, 120 years. Those three months mattered a lot because everything the mother could ever pray, everything the mother could ever desire, everything the mother could ever imagine, he poured that prayer of love, desire of love on that child. Don't minimize the time you spend in any place. Three hours, three weeks, three months, it's going to be significant in your future. And the time you spend, and the time we spend together here will be significant in your future in Jesus' name. Look at verse 21. In verse 21, and when he was cast out, Pharaoh's daughter took him up and nourished him for her own son. When he was cast out, the Lord made a divine arrangement that he will come in when you are cast out. The Lord will make a divine arrangement, you'll come back in. Then in verse 22, it says, And Moses was learned, that's the formation of the man. And Moses was learned, O Lord, I see the vision. I'm going to be a deliverer. Why do I need to learn all this? My child, learn everything. It will be useful in building the tabernacle. It will be useful in writing on the tables. It will be useful in your doggedly going on without any discouragement and without any tiredness. Learn everything you can learn. You don't say, why am I here? Why do I go to school? Why am I going through the training? Everything God passes you through will be the time of formation for what the Lord is taking you to. And that Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and it was mighty in words. Mighty in words. The man knew how to use language because of the training that he had. And the future ministry of Moses was going to be on the use of language. You have to be mighty in words to tell all these millions of, uh, of uh, Israelites what to do, when to do that, and the consequence of doing that. And it was mighty indeed. The Lord formed him. The Lord will form you. Yeah. He will train you. Yeah. He will develop you. And you will be formable, amenable. You will be flexible in the hand of the Lord as he's teaching you and transforming you and training you in Jesus' name. I say chapter 43, and you're looking at verse 7. Even everyone, look at that. Even everyone that is called by my name, for I have created him for my glory. Have that in mind because that's what God has in mind. He has created you for his glory. I have formed him. Yea, I have made him. And he says everyone, that gives me the confidence and the courage and the conviction to say you are being formed by the hand of the Almighty. Amen. 
Everything that happens, everything you go through, every road you tread, and every path you take, the Lord is using everything to form you. And when you come out at the end of that formation, you live and minister and serve for his glory in Jesus' name. That's the formation of the man of destiny. Number two now, let's look at the face of a man of destiny. The face of a man of destiny. Hebrews chapter 11, and we're reading from verse 24. Hebrews 11, verse 24. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, when he was come to years, you know, there are people that never come to years, always babies always immature they think like a child they are not just childlike they are childish childish in the sense that they don't know what's around them they don't know where they're coming from they don't know where they're going they don't know why they are where they are they do not discern they do not understand the forming or formation of god in their lives but if we're going to be where we ought to be we cannot be an excellent minister excellent man excellent daughter in childishness we must come out of that childish level and childish understanding and come to years you are coming to years when the lord will say that the right time now i'm taking you now to the next step and the next step and thank god one day you will arrive so by faith moses when he was come to years refused to be called the son of pharaoh's daughter a man of destiny comes to the point in his life a woman of destiny comes to a point in her life you must re refuse something before you receive something higher the comfort of the palace and the ease and the luxury of being a son of Pharaoh's daughter, the prestige, the authority of being the uh, son of Pharaoh's daughter, the isolation and the insulation of being the son of Pharaoh's daughter. If that's what you want all through life, you don't want any discomfort in life, you don't want any jolting in life, you don't want any pressure in in life you wake up the breakfast is ready for the son of pharaoh's daughter and any any time one clothes you have not even one eat too much this not fit again for pharaoh's daughter uh, for the son of pharaoh's daughter they change that every time everybody serves you and this comfort zone is so it's so full of pleasure that's that's where you want to remain you'll never get to that point where the lord has formed you always ask the question why did god preserve me from that river water that i didn't drown there why did god spot me out and now i have all this formation and all this training always think about that am i going to remain here this one is uh, is uh, comfortable for the flesh but this is not the place the permanent place of the man of destiny and therefore you have to refuse something so that you can receive another thing for by faith moses when he was come to years refused to be called the son of pharaoh's daughter have you ever refused anything it looks good looks nice and it looks befitting and even other people envy that if i could have that all the other israelites in egypt they envied the position that moses occupied and yet moses 
Moses himself said, for a man of destiny, for a man who is going to deliver the whole of the nation of Israel out of captivity, this comfort zone will swallow me up. And therefore, he refused. Think about it in your life now. What you have to refuse, what you have to give up, what you have to jettison, what you have to kick away from your life and then get to the path where God will say, that's right Moses, that's right Moses, that's what I've been forming you for, you have come out, you will come in. I say you will come in. Look at verse 25. In verse 25, choosing rather to suffer affliction. That's not what we naturally choose. Once there is um, any difficulty on the way in the ministry, we don't choose that. We look around. How comfortable was I 10 years ago? And our mind goes to the place of comfort. But if you're a man of focus, a woman of focus, and you know that this is the path that leads to the ministry of excellence and to what the Lord has raised you up, you choose. You make your choice. The Lord will not impose anything on you. He will not say, no, by force you have to be there. Our earthly parents may impose something on us and the earthly coaches may impose something on us. They'll say, you're the man to play that part in the game. So we have to impose this on you. God will not impose anything on you. He says, I put life and death before you. And I, I put, um, you know, upward journey and downward journey before you choose. Choose this. It instructs you. It inspires you. He'll guide you. He'll say, this is what to choose. But in the final analysis, the choice is in your hand. Say, the choice is in my hand. Choosing rather, choosing rather, choosing rather to suffer affliction. If you knew that God will use you, and he will use you to deliver three million people of your people, you'll deliver them out of captivity, spiritual captivity. You'll deliver them out of captivity, social captivity. You'll deliver them out of satanic captivity. And yet, between here and the point of ministry, there are thorns in the way. There are difficulties in the way. There are pebbles in the way. There are challenges in the way. Will you still go? That's what made Moses a man of destiny. That's what will make you a man of destiny. Nature runs away from pain. Nature runs away from pain pressure. Nature runs away from difficulty. And yet in this life, we have to get out of our comfort zone in Egypt and go through the wilderness and then you'll be in the land of promise. But if you're always standing here at the shore and you're looking ahead to the place, the land of promise. And you see all the wilderness in between. And you are resisting the possibility of even starting the journey because... This is going to bring some discomfort. It's going to bring some pain. It's going to bring some challenges. My brother, my sister, how do you get there? How do you take all this? The millions of people are waiting for you. They're saying no other person. And you are the man of the hour. You are the woman of the hour. You will make your choice. And so, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Verse 26, and then it says, esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. All these sentences are very important. On the one hand, 
the pleasures and the treasures of Egypt. The position, the authority in Egypt, the prestige, and all the paraphernalia, and all the things that are comfortable in Egypt. That on the one hand, and then the reproach of Christ. The reproach of the people from whom Christ is going to come. The degradation, the shame, the belittling of the people of Israel from where Christ will come. Now that doesn't look inviting and yet a man of destiny will know that if I stay with the treasures and the pleasures of Egypt is just for a time. If I go to this side, a little pain, a little challenge, a little discomfort, you'll bring millions out of the land of captivity. He made a good choice. You will make a good choice. You will not look at temporary pain and then stay there and say, I never want to go through into that. <laughs> no, nothing in life comes so cheap. But he esteemed the reproach of Christ. Greater riches than the treasures in Egypt for he had respect, regard unto the recompense of the reward. And then in verse 27, it says, By faith he forsook Egypt. By faith he forsook Egypt. Now, don't, don't think about the physical departure from Egypt. He forsook Egypt first in his mind. Second, in his very soul. In his very spirit, he forsook Egypt. And now physically, he forsook Egypt. Can I remind you, the children of Israel, at large, majority of them, especially the mixed multitude, physically, they left Egypt. But they never really forsook Egypt. Every time there's a challenge in the way, every time there is uh, some discomfort in the wilderness, we remember the onions and the garlics and the everything we ate in Egypt. Why are we here? It, it, it's something to forsake Egypt physically. It's another thing from your mind, from your heart to say that is past. I close the door. I lock the door. My mind will not even go back to that place again. Because if he remembered all the pleasures and all the treasures and all the opportunities and everything he had in Egypt, he'll not have the drive to move on. What's pulling us back? What's discouraging us? What's making us to ask ourselves, can I go on? Can I move on? Can I progress? Can I still have the promised land in front of me? We're remembering it was more convenient when we were in the land of Egypt. And all the things were etched there. And all the pleasures were at there. And all the good, good things were at there. We're always remembering that. And so we're not really able to forsake Egypt. Our feet are moving in this direction. Our mind is moving in the opposite direction. It's when you understand, I know where I'm going, and I know where, why I am going there. In your mind, in your heart, in your spirit, in your soul, as well as your body, you forsake the past. I forsake the past. I said I forsake the past. And the Lord will use you. For an excellent ministry. It says by faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured a seeing him who is invisible. A seeing him who is invisible. You know, Moses, that's what helped him. And I pray that this transferable concept will help you in Jesus' name. I see Pharaoh's daughter who claimed me as her son. 
I see God above her. And I'm not looking at Pharaoh's daughter. I'm looking at God. I see Pharaoh's daughter teaching me the language of Egypt because she wants me to be the one that will raise. She is a woman. She cannot reign on the land of Egypt. And she's always telling me, my son, my son. And my mind, even though I don't talk out, I say, who is your son? I'm the minister of God. I said I'm a minister of God. And then eventually he was with Jethro. And Jethro made life easy and convenient. Take my daughter, you have her for a wife. Thank you. And then uh, all my cattle, I dismiss all the people that were helping with the cattle before. I put you in church. Thank you, sir. I give you good accommodation, but... Moses saw the invisible. He saw that this is not my final bus stop. Why? Because I see the invisible. While all the other servants are looking at the visible, at the tangible, at something they can see and hold, he was looking at the invisible. And now they eventually he was called and he came back and God said, I give you uh, Aaron to be your assistant. Thank you, Lord. He will be your spokesman. Thank you, Lord. And yet, he was not seeing just Aaron. If Aaron becomes so big that that's the only picture, the only figure you see, Aaron is going to lead the rest of the people, all of them. While Moses was on the mountain, he led them back into idolatry. But that man, he wasn't looking just at Aaron. He saw the invisible. Didn't he come to the land of Cain, to the wilderness? And then all the Amalekites were there to stop them and say, This is the end of the road. He saw beyond the Amalekites. What I'm saying is, if your God is small, but the Amalekites are big, and the giants are big, and Pharaoh is big, and Pharaoh's daughter is, you know, big beyond normal appearance. You will not have the chance and the driver and the acceleration, the speed to get you where you need to get to. But when you always see the invisible, and it's always there, it says, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. His power will get you through. And when you walk by that kind of faith, that you always see the invisible one, nothing will ever crush you. Yeah. And you will be that man and that woman that you ought to be in Jesus' name. I come to number three. We're looking at number three here, the focus of movement towards destiny the focus that is what you pin your gaze your eyesight on you're always looking forward you you first want your life you say at the end of this that's where i'm going to be it's your joy when the things are tall and when the, the, when the uh, slope is very steep, that is your joy. You're always looking ahead and looking ahead. When there's no water, you're looking at the place where will be the land of milk and honey. And when uh, it looks like all the people are murmuring around you, why this, why this, and why that, your mind is always at that end, at the peak of the journey. And and I pray you'll always set your eyes on that in Jesus' name. You'll be a focused man, a focused man. Show me a man that is not focused, is here. When there's a little challenge there, he gets away and goes to another scene. And then there's a little blockage there, he moves to another. It's not a man of focus. It's not a woman of focus. It's doubtful if that man will ever get to the peak of excellence in life and ministry. But the reason why you are here is to cut off all the distractions of the past in your life. 
and then to look straight and say that is where i am going and you will get there I'm talking to somebody particularly this morning and I said he, she will get there in Jesus name. Amen. The focus, the focus of movement towards destiny. That means you are never at a standstill. You are never staying here and wondering can I, should I, may I. Every day you are moving forward. Every day you are achieving something. Every day a step at a time. A moment at a time. A message at a time. A ministration at a time. An upward climb at a time. You are making every day to contribute to the place you are going. That's the focus we're talking about. Look at Exodus chapter 3, and we're looking at verse 8. It says, And I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the, of the Egyptians. That was his focus. What did he leave Jethro? That's his focus. What did he leave all the sheep and all the cattle of Jethro? That's the focus. What did he come out? That's the focus. What did he go beyond the burning bush? That's the focus. You have the focus in your life that God is raising you up to bring them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land uh, unto a good land and a large a good land and a large don't question lord i've seen uh, how good the land of egypt is can any other land be as good as the land of egypt don't question god sees everything have you noticed when you are in an aeroplane up there and you look down you see all the land you see the river you see the houses because god is on top there he can see everything at the same time and when you see those things at the same time you can make comparison god up there he sees the land of egypt he sees the land of canaan you cannot see that because you are down below here but because it's up there it can make the comparison where he's taking you to even though you have not seen it now it's much much better than where you are now and then it says unto a good land and a large unto a land flowing with milk and honey now you may not understand that language but moses understood the land of egypt was not flowing uh, even with water they had to use a can jerry can or whatever kind of can and take water out, out of the nile and then they have to be pouring the water by themselves to the land of egypt and then he said god says the land i'm taking you to will not just be overflowing with water it'll be overflowing with milk and honey Amen. Amen. Your future is unimaginable. Amen. It's incomparable to what you have ever seen in the past in Jesus' name. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 6. I'm reading from verse 23. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 23. It says, And he brought us out from this. Look at that. He brought us out from this that he might bring us in out in he brought us out that's not the end that he might bring us in to give us the land which is where unto our fathers and that was the focus of moses all the time today you're going to reset your focus because you know if it, it's like setting an alarm clock you have something 
you want to do that will matter something you have to do that will contribute to the whole of life and so the previous night you see to do this tomorrow and do that tomorrow and do that tomorrow i need to set this alarm and you set it at a particular time and as you are sleeping even before the alarm rings i am asleep but my mind is awake because of the focus the same thing as you said the alarm of life and you know that alarm is going to ring and you are not the person that when the alarm rings you put your hand there and stop it i want to sleep more because you have a goal maybe you want to travel and the plane is going to leave at this particular time and that alarm is to move you wake you up and move you on i pray there will be an alarm clock in your own heart that you'll know because of where I'm going, because of what I am going to do, that alarm rings and I must be awake because I have come out that I may go in. And this is the era in your life when you will go in. I said you will go in. And you will not just go in by yourself. You will take thousands and hundreds of thousands and millions along with you to go in in Jesus' name. And that has to be your focus. We're coming to point number two here. Number two, we're looking at the findings of a man of destiny findings of a man of destiny exodus chapter 3 and i'm reading from verse 11 and moses said unto god who am i you're going to find your deficiency you're going to find your own impossibility you're going to find the evidence of what everybody you met on earth has told you that is said who do you think you are Muslim, the mother said, who do you think you are? And the teacher said, who do you think you are? And you begin to say, true, true. Who do, you, who do I think I am? Why should I have such a grandiose vision? Who am I? And the things they were saying have become part of you. It has come from who do you think you are to who do I think I am? And now as this time arrived all the things that have been reaching on his mind on his heart who do you think you are we have to erase that and write a new script on your heart everything you have thought about yourself i'm down there we have to erase it today everything you have thought what can i do we have to erase that from your heart today of the millions of people in you know in our land who do i think i am and who is my family to have this dream and this ideal and this height we have to erase that from your heart the findings of a man of destiny and moses said unto god who am i that i of all people should go unto pharaoh and that i should bring forth the children of israel out of egypt but that's what you will do you don't think you can but you can and you will and you must and it will be done as long as you are looking at the same picture every day that picture will become entrenched in your heart and the question who am i will be entrenched in your heart but there are times we have to tear some uh, some pictures away physically physically look at that picture <laughs> you know looking down there and you never like to look up you're an introvert always looking down and you are a backward person always looking down almost using your hand to crawl it to cover your face because you, you don't like the face when you see it in the mirror you know we have to tear that picture away in your mind tear all the old pictures and then imagine a better person a higher person 
an ongoing person, a person that is a go-getter and say the past is gone in your life has begun today. We cheer the past, all that we're finding. Who am I? And we say now, this is who I am, a man of destiny. You see in the house, a woman of destiny, is she in the house today? Cheer the old and replace it with the new. We're looking at three things here. Number one, the initial failure of a man of desires. Number two, the inner fears of a man at a dead end. Number three, the inactive forties of a man of destiny. Look at number one. Number one, we're looking at the initial failure of a man of desires. I'm sure you know the story. Uh, Moses came out and he saw one Egyptian fighting against an Israelite. And he thought, this is my chance. And he got rid of that Egyptian and buried that Egyptian. He thought he had done well. And the second day he came as an achiever. And then he saw two Israelites fighting together. He thought they will understand that he was the deliverer. And he said, ah, why are you fighting against each other? We're trying to deliver you from the hands of the people who are fighting against your life. And here you are fighting against each other. And the other fellow looked at him and said, I hear you. Tell me, by the way, what's your identity? Who are you to come over here and rule over me and change my uh, purpose and what I'm going to do? You want to kill? me all right go ahead you want to kill me like you killed that egyptian yesterday and he fled he fled he was a failure but you know god does not look at you on the basis of your initial failure who has not failed before? When you try to write the alphabets, how did you write? Didn't you fail? When you try to recite the multiplication table, didn't you fail? When you try to write the first essay at school, didn't you fail? When you try to write a bicycle, didn't you fall? When you try to do something, maybe you're still remembering that everyone has the initial failure. But when we're going to cross over that hurdle. God doesn't think you've done a permanent job when you have failed. Understand that. God does not think you've done a permanent job when you have failed. Your enemies think you've done a permanent job. Even your friends think you've done a permanent job. And the people around you will always want to remind you, uh, uh, <laughs> limit your joy and limit your expectation. Remember who you are. God doesn't remember. When he forgives you, he forgets. I didn't hear your amen. <laughs> and so, the initial failure of a man of desires. His desires, thinking they will understand, God has raised me up to deliver them. But those initial failures, God forgives, God forgets, and God said, Moses, we can still do it together. You're still my man. And the Lord is saying, whatever happened yesterday, whatever happened the previous years, you're still his man. You're still his woman. Look at number two here. Number two, we're looking at the inner fears of a man at a dead end. A man at a dead end. It's like I've come to the dead end. There's no way. There's no road through this place. And the fears he had, you know, sometimes you come to a dead end. Maybe you go through that way. And then they put a signboard here and they say, no thorough fear. 
dead end. Then you turn and come this way and you see the same sign body again and it says no thoroughfare, dead end. Now your mind is tricked into thinking every other way will be a dead end and fear will swell up in your heart there is something there's an invisible power invisible force and it's uh, telling me that everywhere i go there'll be a dead end no the dead end was for that time today's thoroughfare is now before you Look at this, we're looking at Exodus chapter 3, and we're looking at verse 10. It says, come now, don't delay, come now, therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Look at verse 11. In verse 11, and Moses said unto God, Me, who am I? We're comparing ourselves with other people. That man, a great communicator, who am I? That man, a great achiever, who am I? That man, a great prospective person, who am I? That man, a crowd puller in politics, but who am I? That one, he has a great intelligence quotient. Who am I? That one can run fast, but who am I? You see, all that comes up. That's what we find, and it's all right. Because when you become small in your own sight, your God becomes a great God. Somebody said, I'm a little man, I'm a small woman serving a great God that can do everything and all things and will do that in your life in Jesus' name. And when you think, who am I? Begin to remember that God is your sufficiency. God is my provider. God is my sufficiency. And God is the power and the authority behind me, behind you, behind everyone in Jesus' name. When you think of sufficiency, think of 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and we're looking at verse 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, looking at verse 5, it says, Not that we are sufficient of ourselves. Moses, who am I? Not that we are sufficient of ourselves. David, who am I? Uh, not that we are sufficient of ourselves. So telling David, you cannot. This one you are trying to confront, you want to confront, as being a warrior from his youth. And who are you to think that you can do this? Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but... Our sufficiency is of God. My sufficiency is of God. My sufficiency is of God. Now, if you have been saying, I'm not able, I'm not deficient, I'm not sufficient, I'm not educated, I don't have what it takes. If you've been saying that for 40 years, if you've been saying that, for 50 years, if you've been saying that for more than 60 years now, one sentence and saying my sufficiency is of God will not totally erase all that you have in the past. I remember when we used to have the, we used to use the eraser at the end of the pencil. And we've written something and we want the page to be clean and clear. And we're on that eraser once over that thing we've written 
everything doesn't clear off. We have to run that eraser again. And we have to run that eraser over and over and over. If we don't take off what we have reaching with that eraser, any new thing you write on that same line it will be confused because the old is trying to come out and the uh, new is trying to be impressed. You have to run that eraser, run that eraser, run that eraser over every negative thing you've said before and lo and behold, your page is now clean. Your page is now clear, and now you can write the new image and the new sentence that God is your sufficiency. You can write on that, and when you say it now, there is nothing popping off from underneath to say, Who are you? You are the man of the hour. Who am I? You are the daughter of destiny. And what we have erased, we are not going to allow it to come up again in Jesus' name. The inner fears that we have is that we cannot we erase that and now we say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Anybody wanting to say that? I can. I can do all things through Christ. Who strengthens me? Be it confirmed in your life in Jesus' name. We're looking at number three here. Number three, we're looking at the inactive forties of a man of destiny. I'm sure you know. We don't need to, you know, read so many scriptures on this, but the scriptures are there. The life of Moses, the first forty years, and then the next. 40 years and 80 years now concluded and the desire he had in mind before he thought the children of Israel would know that God had raised him up to deliver them out of the land of Egypt the first 40 years came to an end and that fellow said who are you to come and tell me here what you do and not what you do do you want to kill me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday the first 40 years he knew was they were inactive to achieve what the Lord has called him to. And the people of the world will say, a fool at 40, tell me what they say. It's a fool forever. Now, if Moses bought into that, he'll never try anything new. You failed and failed and failed until 40 years. Forget about it. A fool at 40 is a fool forever. But God doesn't talk like that. Listen to God in your life will begin. And then you have the next 40 years. The next 40 years is spent at the back of the desert. He was taking care of animals, not taking care of people and it was a lonely life it was it would lead the cattle out and lead them in once in a while the jethro will say how are you doing there how are they cut uh, the jethro was more concerned about his cattle than about the man and the next 40 years came now and god said moses moses he called him after the burning bush and said somebody is calling my name after if a fool at 40 is a fool forever a fool at 80 is a fool forevermore <laughs> but then God called him at 80 can I tell you to do some spiritual mathematics divide your life now into two and make the first part let's say for example you are now 60 years of age divide into two you have 30 30 am i right yes. i should be i'm a mathematician <laughs> and then the first 30 is gone and you're looking at what did i achieve the first 30 years look at that look at that look at that next to nothing the next 30 years what have I achieved? Look at that. Maybe next to nothing. That's George part one, part two, part three is the real time. <laughs> 40, 40, 
Echi gone, and now the miracle that Moses never saw in the first 80 years, the next 40 years will duplicate them. Water out of the rock. Never happened in the first 80 years. Now, the next 40 years, and bringing Egypt on their knees. That never happened in the first 80 years. The next 40 years will tell a better story. And then moving on, even the Red Sea, he never even swam in the Red Sea. But now to create without any bridge, a passage out of the Red Sea and move on to the other side, uh, that will happen in the last 40 years. Don't, don't mind whatever might have happened, whatever might not have happened in the first 40 and 40, 80 years today in the beginning of that excellent ministry <laughs> achieving and climbing and progressing will happen in your life in Jesus name in active 40 years yet that that first 40 was inactive unproductive the next 40 inactive unproductive that says nothing my past says nothing about my future my past my past says nothing about my future your future will be brighter than your past in jesus name we're coming to number three now. We're coming to number three. Number three is the faithfulness of a man of destiny. Look at Hebrews chapter three, and we're looking at verse two. Hebrews chapter three, and we're looking at verse two. Who was faithful to him that appointed him, as Moses also was faithful in all his house faithful in all his house a man like that the first 80 years gone and nothing of value came out the first 40 80 years gone and nothing of preservation came out this chance i have now every day will count every month will count and the faithfulness that he had done he had had in the house of pharaoh and the faithfulness to jethro he must multiply that and now be faithful in all the house all the habitation of god when you look at the past and then god has given you a chance a chance to reverse everything of the past whatever had happened in the past you want to say whatever chance i have now I will be faithful. And you have a great chance now ahead of you, and you are going to be faithful in Jesus' name. We're looking at, a, at three things here. Number one, we're looking at the face of a man of decision and determination. You can see it on the face. A man with the face of decision and determination number two is the forthrightness of a man of devotion and doctrine number three is the foreverness of a man of distinction and uh, destiny the foreverness of forgettableness of a man with distinction and destiny let's look at number one number one we're looking at the face of a man of decision and uh, determination we're looking at isaiah chapter 50 verse 7 isaiah chapter six, chapter 50 verse 7 for the lord god will help me who is that me then <laughs> the lord will help you now, what reason will the Lord have not to help you? Because you are a sinner, 
all have seen and come short of the glory of God. If he helped anybody, all those people he helped in the past, they were sinners too. The Lord helped them because you failed before. Is that so? All the people you are looking at that are succeeding now, they failed before. If the Lord helped them, it will help you. Because I've not reached the pinnacle of education. I hear you. But look at Peter, a fisherman. He didn't reach the pinnacle of university education. And the Lord helped him. Looks like you are the next one online. Yeah. And the Lord will help you in Jesus' name. Yeah. For the Lord God will help me. Therefore shall I not be confounded. Therefore have I set my Face. You can tell if somebody has doubt, you can tell on his face. You can tell if somebody is happy and excited, you can tell on his face. You can tell if somebody is going somewhere and he says everything clear out of my way. I'm going somewhere, you can tell on his face. You can tell if somebody is uh, dropping and dropping uh, and discouraged and is saying, What is all life about? You can tell on his face if a man is a man of destiny if a woman is a woman of destiny you can tell on her face anytime we see you now we see destiny on your face don't block his way he's going somewhere how do I know he's getting somewhere? <laughs> Look at his face. How do I know that she's going somewhere? Look at her face and everything will clear out of the way in Jesus' name. For the Lord God will help me. Therefore, shall I not be confounded? Therefore, have I set my face like a flint? And I know that I shall not be ashamed. I know that you will not be ashamed. Look at number two here. Number two here is the forthrightness of a man of devotion and doctrine. The forthrightness. Now, a forthrightness, that means that when you come, there's no ambiguity in your language. There's no ambiguity in your declaration and in your request that you are making because you are a man of devotion. Look at Exodus chapter 5, verse 1. Afterward, Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go. Let my people go. Can you say that? And then look at chapter 8, verse 1. Chapter 8, verse 1 also tells us the same thing. The Lord spake unto Moses, go unto Pharaoh, and say unto him, Thus says the Lord, tell me, let my people go. Hey, there's no ambiguity in that. I show up again. Huh? What do you have there for this morning? The same thing I said last time, chapter 5, let my people go and when you have that and you know that is what will happen and that is what must happen you are a man of devotion and you are devoted to that thing uh, Moses tell me what doctrine do you have for me today let my people go a man of one goal, a man of one language, a man of one drive, a man of one position, a man of one drive. Let my people go. You are forthright. You are clear. Nobody can doubt that this is what you have in mind. Look at uh, chapter 9, and we're looking at verse 1. In chapter 9, reading there from verse 1, it's still bringing the same message. He's still carrying the same message and he's still waving the same flag. The Lord said unto Moses, go in unto Pharaoh and tell him, thus says the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, tell me, let my people go that they may serve me. Once the message had not been obeyed, you have to say it again. 
and say it again and say it again and eventually you know you might think that what you're saying is as weak as a drop of water but if you have looked at the ceiling and the drop of water is always coming on that spot on that spot on that spot that same drop of water although it is weak in itself inconsequential in itself eventually as you look at the ground that same spot that drop of water has been coming there will be a mark on that spot that's your message that's your message. Let my people go. The devil will have to budge. Let my people go. The, the captors will have to move. Let my people go and the oppressors will have to give up. Let my people go and in devil mark has to be made on the land of Egypt. Now, where they crossed over from the land of Egypt, remember, transferable concept. Now we're transferring that to you and your message must have a mark for the day your life your ministry must have a mark for the day but don't parambolage don't go here and there on that same point on that same issue let that drop of water keep on dropping on that same spot you will win the day we're looking at number three here. Number three, we're looking at the foreverness of a man of distinction and destiny. The foreverness of a man of distinction and destiny. Deuteronomy chapter 34, we're looking at verse 10. And there arose not a prophet since in Israel like unto Moses. There arose not a prophet since in Israel like unto Moses whom the Lord knew face to face. Look at verse 11. In verse 11, in all the signs and the wonders which the Lord sent him to do in the land of Egypt to Pharaoh and to all his servants and to all his land. And then in verse 12, it says, and in all that mighty hand, and in all the great terror which Moses showed in the sight of all Israel. Now, a man that started with who am I? Deficiency, difficulty, discouragement, failure. At the end of his life, it came to who is like him in this generation, in the next generation. That's what the Lord will make of you. Yeah. We'll forget the old time who am I. We'll remember this is who the man, the woman of destiny has become. Now, from that Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges onward. We we'll see Moses is gone, but his mark was still on earth. And now in Revelation chapter 15, we're looking at verse 3. A man that we saw in Exodus, and we keep on seeing him. We keep on seeing him. And we keep on seeing him until the last book of the Bible. Revelation chapter 15, verse 3. And the singer, the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. He came by the side of the Lamb of God, of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when the victorious saints of God have gone in into glory, when they want to sing, they sing the song of Moses, of the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty, just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. No foot could rub off the footprints of Moses until that time and right now is still up yonder with the Lord forever and ever. And when we get there, we'll also see him. 
the foreverness of a man a woman of distinction and destiny what if you came to the lord today and you said lord thank you for the revelation that the journey that is going to begin now will be totally different will be brighter than the journey of the past a man of destiny you are becoming today and a woman of destiny you are becoming today forget the past let the hand of the lord form you train you transform you and then transform you to a man whose work and legacy and ministry will never be forgotten that you too by the side of moses and the worthies of old you'll become a forever man a forever woman distinct and having destiny the hand of the lord is upon you yeah. i'll make of you whatever you have planned from all eternity why don't you rise up and say lord here i am a man not of the past a woman not of the past but a man of destiny look away from the past look at the future something brighter that you ever thought of is coming now open your mouth and talk to the lord in prayer